The topic for today is the gospel is not the church. Say it with me. The gospel is not the church. Uh, every now and then, probably once or twice a year, we'll have to address the issue. What is the issue? Why are we here? And I need to remind us, I, I want to remind all of us why we're here as a church. And so today is one of those messages that kind of kind of give us a little summary, kind of kind of bring us together again, just kind of say, okay, do we have a clear guidance from the Lord where we're going, what, what this ministry is all about? And so I, I picked this topic uh, because that was something that I've been struggling with and just trying to figure out, see, what is the gospel? What is the gospel? Anybody know what gospel meant? It means good news. Hui Anglion in the original Greek. Good news. Okay? A good news. Turn to the person next to you. Have you received the good news? Yeah. Yeah, we, we have to think about the good news on a regular basis because if we believe in sharing the good news with other people, we, we have to say we've got the good news in our lives. Amen? Believe that? Yeah, I believe that. I believe the good news has to be in here first before we start sharing with other people. You have to experience the good news before you can share with others. Okay? But then what is the church? The original Greek word for church is James. Ecclesia. What is ecclesia? It's like in Spanish, iglesia. Right? Iglesia. Iglesia. What is iglesia? What is church? The church means a gathering. And I think the word church in the English language kind of kind of guide us in the wrong path what a church is. We think about church as a building. See? Iglesia is not a bad translation. It's the original translation. It means the gathering. And in the church, when we think about the church, we think about a building or a place. That's neither. The church is God's people gathering together. So I, I want us to think about even beyond the gathering, the gospel is not the gathering. It's not. And so that's what I'm going to preach on this morning. And before that, I, I want to share with you this illustration that I, I learned. And somebody need to pull up my PowerPoint. It's, uh, it's, on, this, it's on this desktop. Just pull up my PowerPoint. It's in the one English. <laughs> okay, church is not the, the gospel is not the church. And, uh, and here, what you see two pictures of. I mean, I rarely use PowerPoint, right? You guys, agree with me? You rarely use PowerPoint because uh, I really don't like PowerPoint that much because sometimes I lose the power and I lose the point. So, so I, uh, that's why we have... <laughs> I rarely use PowerPoint, but today we're going to use PowerPoint, so follow with me, okay? You guys appreciate the effort I put in to put PowerPoint together. Come on. Appreciate the effort. I, you know, nice pictures, right? Come on. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Appreciation. Thank you. You see right here, on one side, you have the cruise ship, and the other side, you have the battleship. Some people think of the church, and this is how they illustrate the church. The church is like a cruise ship. Any of you have been on a cruise? How many of you have been on a cruise lately? Lately, recently. Any been, anybody been on a cruise in the last three months? The last year? Anybody been on a cruise? We're not a cruise-going congregation. That's amazing. Uh, how about last two years? Okay. Where did you go? You went to Mexico. And which part of Mexico did you go? Ensenada? Ensenada. I, I've been on that trip before. And, why would you get on a cruise ship, guys? Come on, why do you go on a cruise ship? <laughs> to do nothing is terrible. To what? To have a vacation. You go on, and when you get on that boat, what do you expect? Come on, somebody tell me, what do you expect when you get on the boat? You get on the boat, you get seasick. Okay, now, now I'm in what you really expect. You don't expect, some of you don't expect to be seasick. You, you're going to be what? You got to stick together? Okay, what else? Swimming pool. I can tell you, for those of you who have been on a cruise, you know you use a buffet every day, every meal, several times a day. All you want. That's what cruises are. Okay? 
Yeah. <laughs> okay. So some people go on a cruise, they expect to gain a few pounds. They, they always, they, they, they do. They do and they, they do expect it. So when, what, assuming it's, it's all you can eat, you know, you already know that. It's all you can eat. You can enjoy the whole amenities on the boat. You have swimming pool. You may have some uh, weight room and treadmill, whatever, you know. You get to use everything the whole time, all right, while you're on this cruise ship. So when you walk on the cruise ship, you expect all these things. Now, how many of you have been on a battleship? Okay. How about, how about live ones? They're actually, the, you know, live ones. The, the ones that, that, that actually are going out to battle. But, but if you haven't, but you can still imagine with me, okay? You can still imagine with me that you're going to get on a battleship. Let's say, what would you be when you're going on a battleship? What do you think? You're probably a, a soldier, a soldier of some sort, right? Getting, you're expecting to do something. What do you expect when you go out on a battleship? A lot of food? <laughs> okay. You expect to go to war. You go in with that you go into the battleship with that kind of mentality that, that you're gonna be prepared for war. Alright? Very different mentality than going on a cruise ship. I mean they're all big boats. Alright? But when you go on a cruise ship, you expect to lounge around, hang out with your friends, get a couple of drinks a day or more and then eat a lot and gain weight. But when you go on a battleship, you expect to be engaging, always alert, ready for the next mission. Isn't that true? All right. Pardon me? Amen. Okay. Okay. That, these are two different kind of mentality. And some people think of church as a cruise ship. Okay. So they get on board, they come onto the church and say, now where's the next party? <laughs> Come on, let's get out. You know, what, what is the entertainment? What do you expect the, the captain to do for you? The captain is there to make sure you have a good time. The captain is there to greet you, make you feel warmly welcome. What do you expect of the crew members? The crew members probably have the same objective. Their job, their job is primarily, of course, to do the necessary thing to keep the, the boat going. But their primary role is to entertain you. So you have an entertainment captain or some sort, you know, someone who's there to, to uh, coordinate the activity, the events, so everybody is happy by the time we're done with this thing. Come on, somebody say amen. All right. But, but then what do you expect of uh, a captain in a, in a battleship? Do you think he's going to spend some time chit-chat with you, talking about, I don't know, roast beef? <laughs> have a couple of drinks together. Well, what do you think this captain is going to do? This captain's probably spent a lot of time. What do you say? Give me instructions. This captain probably spent a lot of time in the war room, training his his, his generals or his his captain, whatever. Uh, what, what would that be? Captains would be uh, someone. So other commanders, and they'll be coming together and strategizing what what's in the next mission and how to accomplish their goals. Right? The, one, the reason I'm looking at Thomas is because he's still in the Air Force. Okay, so I just want to make sure I, I'm, I'm using the right kind of, uh, right terminology and, and giving you guys the right ideas, you know. I, I don't want to mislead you guys, all right. So, so we're, we're all, the, the captain of our battleship will be engaging on, on the, the main objective, what, what, whatever they're out there in the sea. Okay, and they're getting the crew together and, and kind of train them and get them disciplined and get them ready for the battle, you know. Very different mentality. And some churches are like a battleship. So everybody come in, you are a soldier. You get ready for war. All right, uh, every other week there's a training, you know, getting ready to go out and fight. Good fight for the Lord. Come on, somebody say amen. All right, you're not supposed to have fun. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> no fun. You're here to do your job. Now, what is a real church? I, I think the church is kind of like, like both, you know? You, you can't have a church without mission. <laughs> some, people, some people can't have any fun because all they think about is that we're at a war. 
And then you have also people always thinking, you know, hey, let's hang out, let's have some fun together. And you gotta have a bit of both. Come on, all right? You gotta have a little bit of both. But I can ask you, what are some of the best friends that you can make? All right, how do you make best friends? Some of the good friends you make in a cruise. How do you make good friends in a cruise? <clears throat> play, play some game together? By chit-chatting, having a drink, maybe over dinner, right? Some of my friends, our friends are made over a meal, over a drink, right? And then how do you make friends in the battlefield? Yeah, people on the same team in a war together, all right? You're there fighting for another person. You're helping that person survive. And, and, I, and I think some of your relationship in, in the dining hall <laughs> that we build over the bar are the kind of relationship that are going to be solidified in the battlefield. Are, are you with me? You understand? And, and, and vice versa. You, you can't, you really don't know what kind of relations you have unless the relationship is tested and given an objective and you go out there and you you see things really taking place wow that's real you know this person is really gonna die for me or s s protect me you know maybe risking his own life that kind of friendship is worthwhile and I want you to think about that and relate that to the church you know the church we we are a body and some of you don't understand that we are at war. And it's like, are we at war? I didn't know that we're at war. <laughs> but, but yeah, the Bible keeps on reminding us we're at war. At war with what? And, and with this, I want to introduce the concept of the kingdom. Because the gospel is not the church. Some people think about the church as, as what the good news is. Inviting people to the church. But when we talk about the kingdom, that's when we begin to talk about the concept of warfare. Warfare. And, and uh, to introduce the idea of the kingdom, and I want to bring in a, a prophetic word from Old Testament, from the, from the prophet Daniel. Prophet Daniel. And if you're familiar with this passage, you, you know that Daniel was uh, around 605 B.C. He, he lived around that time before Christ. And, uh, and he was serving under kings, okay, as a wise man. And then in this passage, in this context, the, the, the king had a dream. And it was so crazy, uh, confounded all the wise men. Nobody knew uh, because the, the king demanded that they tell him the dream before he, you know. So, so none of the wise men was able to tell the king the dream. And, and Daniel was able to interpret the dream. It was crazy. And this is what, what he said at the end of this interpretation in verse 40 and 45 of chapter 2. Uh, would you read it with me? Okay, verse 44. In the time of those kings... The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to another people. It will crush all those in kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will himself endure forever. This is the meaning of the vision of the rock cut out of the mountain, but not by human hands. A rock that broke the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold to pieces. The great God has shown the king what will take place in the future. The dream is true and his interpretation is trustworthy. Okay. Follow me for a moment, okay? Here, Daniel is interpreting a, a, this, this dream that, that talks about this beautiful statue of gold, silver, clay, and browns, and iron. And, and, this, this, and the way he interpreted it is that every one of them represents a kingdom of men. Okay? Every one of these different materials is a, is a man-made kingdom. So we're talking about a earthly kingdom. Say with me, earthly kingdom. Okay, but then in this story there was a rock, okay, that that was a vision of the rock cut out out of a mountain somewhere that it came out of a mountain and came and smashed everything, everything to bits, okay. And this talks about is is the kingdom of God. Do you see that? There is a kingdom, uh, the. God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will be left to another people. It will crush, crush all these kingdoms and those kingdoms and bring them to an end. And it will self-endure forever. Now this is the kingdom that God is setting here on hev in heaven or on earth? On earth. Because we're talking about all these different 
different materials. You got gold, silver, and so forth. All these kingdoms, he's referring to the kingdoms of, earth, of men. And, and God is going to take his rock that is not of the work of men. It's not built by men. It came from the mountain somewhere, cut out of a mountain, and, and threw at this thing and, and destroyed everything. And what, what does this mountain represent? It's, it's part of God. It's original. It was not built by men. It came from God originally. And God is going to rule here on earth. And this is the kingdom he's talking about. Here's the kingdom. All right? So, this is the prophetic word from, from Daniel. And, and then now we look at in, in the New Testament time. And we know that there is another rock. Another rock. What is this rock? When, when Jesus confronted his disciples and said, what, what do you say that I am? And some people say, you are a prophet, blah, 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 Isaiah, blah, blah, blah. But then, but Peter says, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that's when Jesus says, Matthew 16, 18. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. It's the same rock that Daniel prof prophesied that is going to smash all the kingdoms of man. And he is going to use that as a foundation to build what? church all right he's here to build a church with that foundation and that rock that destroy all the kingdoms of men is going to be our foundation is our foundation are you guys okay aren't you guys like that wow I didn't know that no you didn't say that okay all right well this is amazing stuff I mean this is a prof prophesied by Daniel and, and Jesus came all right so so I'm gonna spend actually very little time to walk us through the book of Matthew really quick on this idea of the kingdom of God because to me Matthew spent a lot of time talking about the kingdom and and see if we can connect all the story together all right so the brief survey of Matthew we got is what is the kingdom of God what is the relationship between the church and God's kingdom all right listen carefully all right, so, so we began with chapter 3, but actually should begin with chapter 1 and 2, shouldn't I? What do you think chapter 1 and 2 of Matthew talks about? Talks about the genealogy, and what Matthew proved to us was that Jesus was going to be that king that was born. Jesus was prophesied, and he was part of the lineage of the kingship, and he was the one that the Bible Old Testament prophesied to be the one that is going to be a foundation, that rock that the church is built on. Okay? And so we're going to look at chapter 3 and chapter 4. And chapter 3 we see um, in those days John the Baptist came preaching the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And that the same thing after Jesus was baptized and he begins his earthly ministry, he began by saying this. From that time on, Jesus began to preach. Preach what? Repent for the kingdom of what? Heaven has come near. Is it not the same message John the Baptist was preaching? Is it not the same message that Jesus is preaching? Is it no coincidence? It's about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. It's never been about the church. It's about the kingdom of God. Jesus came preaching about the kingdom. All right? So listen carefully. What is the component that is re required for you to enter in the kingdom? What is that component? Come on. Repent. Repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What do we need to repent from? We need to repent from the, all the earthly kingdoms. The earthly kingdoms. You see, the earthly kingdom comes with its earthly values. The earthly kingdom comes with earthly traditions. The earthly kingdom comes with earthly culture. Are you with me? Somebody say amen. Okay. The way we think, the way we live, the way we talk, the way we just, we are as people. We need to repent from that. So that we can enter into a new kingdom with new sets of values, with new sets of traditions, and new sets of culture. Do you believe the church, the kingdom has a kingdom culture? Has the kingdom has kingdom values? What do you think Matthew 5, the, the Beatitudes, was talking about? Jesus was transforming their mind about the values that they hold. 
You thought the rich people are blessed, but I tell you, blessed are the poor. Are you with me? He's teaching them a new way of thinking. Say, the way you think about the, the world, about life, is, is, is no good, I can tell you. It leads, leads us to a certain place, and that's not good. All right? And here, I'm introducing a new kingdom. And this new kingdom, you need to repent first. And what's the prerequisite for repentance? I tell you, it's humility. Okay? You have to humble yourself and say, God, I was wrong. God, I am wrong for following the ways of this world. God, I am wrong for following, living my life with the principles of this world. God, I'm wrong, so therefore, I am going to take on your ways. Because the ways of the gold, of the silver, of the, of the different stones, and all, all these things are not going to take us anywhere. So here, we're, we're bringing... God's people back to his heart into the kingdom of God okay so we need to repent those are the, what is the kingdom of God it is citizens of repentant people here in this kingdom are repentant okay if you don't repent you can't go into the kingdom and the next thing we, we find in chapter 6 is talk about the kingdom and chapter 6 here there's a very familiar passages verse 10 says your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What do you think this is from? It's from the, the Lord's Prayer, right? We, we know how to recite this. Everybody knows this by heart. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth. And the following, verse 33 says, be, But seek first, what? His kingdom and His righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. And talk about the blessings of this world. You seek Him first and His kingdom first. Okay? And that's consistent with the prayer that Lord taught his disciples it's very consistent talking about what again it's about the kingdom so I want to share with you you must understand the Lord in your prayer life in all that your dealings in the world the most important priority is what the kingdom the goal for the believers ultimately you seek the kingdom everything is about the kingdom food no kingdom clothes no kingdom job no kingdom everything is about the kingdom and nothing else and so so it's about the kingdom it's not about the church the gospel the good news is about the kingdom of God all right so let's go on there's a few more verse 10 and verse uh, chapter 10 verse uh, chapter 11 chapter 10 verse 7 said as you go proclaiming this message the kingdom of heaven has come near what do you think Jesus was was teaching his disciples He's teaching his disciples, when you go out and preach the gospel, as you go to different cities, this is what you're supposed to do. Okay? Instead, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to go and tell people to go to church. No, it's not about that. It's not about the church. It's about what? It's about the kingdom of God has come near. The important thing is that I'm going to go out there and say, Jeremy, hey, I, I believe God is ruling in my life, and I believe that God can rule in your life. And there's a kingdom right here. Chapter 11, verse 11 tells us, Truly I tell you, among those born of woman, there has not given arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist. He's praising John the Baptist, by the way. Yet, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Okay? So, this, this, this passage has confounded the wisest people in the world. All right? Some of the greatest theologians had, had that greatest debate over this passage. And for the longest time, people had... had you know, back in back in days when I was in high school, <laughs> there, there was a there's a lot of different theologians arguing over this topic. But but I think the nowadays is, is no longer a debate on this matter. Uh, but what what is what does does say a few things though? The, among women, there is no one greater than John the Baptist. He's one of the greatest prophet of the Old Testament time. Wouldn't we all agree? Because he brought he's the one who kind of heralded in Jesus Christ. He's the one that you know, we even mentioned in the early part, chapter three. He's the one who's like, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right? Same person. Same person, John the Baptist. But while he was in prison by Herod, okay, he began to doubt Jesus. He says, he sent his disciples to talk to Jesus. You know, are you the one that we prophesied to come or are you not? And then Jesus says, oh, okay, just tell him uh, what, what we're doing here. We're, we're, we're setting free the, the captives. We're, we're letting the blind see and then the lame walk and so forth. All right. 
So this is what, what's going on. But what it says here, though, the second half kind of confuses us. Yeah, whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. In other words, whoever is in the kingdom of heaven, okay, is greater than John. Whoever is in the, the least in the kingdom is greater than John. In other words, did John make it to the kingdom? Come on, somebody tell me. The least is greater than John. Does that mean John made it into the kingdom or not? Come on, you guys. Say, what's the obvious answer? No. No, he did not make it into the kingdom. And we cannot conceive that John the Baptist, such a great prophet, not making it into the kingdom. I mean, that is just inconceivable. Okay? So what do we do? So we, we made a very big controversy over this, an argue and debate over this, and that's it. We leave it as that and say, okay, we can agree to disagree. Come on, we can agree to disagree. Everybody say it with me. We can agree to disagree. But I think the kingdom that Jesus is talking about is a different kind of kingdom. He's referring to a kingdom here on... Come on, say it with me. He's a, referring to a kingdom here on earth. He's referring to a kingdom here on... Because in the Daniel prophecy, it prophesied about a kingdom... And we already know that kingdom, God's kingdom, is in the heavens, obviously. But we're praying for a kingdom to be here, what? On earth. So, so why do we pray the Lord's prayers? May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. So kingdom here on earth is the rulership of God here on earth. And is John the Baptist going to that kingdom in heaven? I don't know. I will hope so. I, I think he might make it there. But you know what? Is he going to make it into the kingdom here on earth? No. No. Obviously, he doesn't have the rule of Christ in his heart for him to be doubting whether or not he was the Messiah. Are you with me so far? Come on. Hello? Are you hearing me? Somebody say amen. Okay. Here again. So, what we're seeing here is that Jesus is teaching through Matthew, God is teaching us through Matthew, that there is a rulership here on earth that John apparently did not make it in. Okay? John the Baptist did not make it in. He may have gotten in in the heaven, eternal life. He may. I don't know because who judges that? God. But then he did not make it into the kingdom. In other words, he did not believe in the lordship reign here on earth. Whoa. Does that change your paradigm a little bit? Does that change your paradigm? Does that change the way you think about life? Because God is talking about him ruling in your life today. I believe that's the core of the gospel. The core of the gospel is not saying the, you know, of the sinner's prayer, raising your hand in an altar call. I, I think it has to do with God ruling in your life today. Who is ruling in your life today? That is a question that everybody needs to ask. Who is ruling your life today? Is it not Christ? If it isn't, then even the least that are of the kingdom is greater than you because you didn't make it in. Okay? The gospel core. The gospel core is about God's rulership in your life. Okay. We're almost done here. Uh, chapter 12 and chapter 13. Chapter 12, 28 says, But if it is by the Spirit of God that I drive out demons, and the kingdom of God has come upon you. And 13 verse 11 says, He replied, Because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. Chapter 12, 28, the context was, was Jesus cast out a demon. And that's when the Pharisees cornered him and said, You are filled with Beelzebub, and therefore you're casting out another demon. He's saying you're, you're demon-possessed, and because you have a bigger demon, therefore you're able to drive out a smaller demon. Okay? But Jesus says, What if I am filled with the Spirit? If I am driving out demons in the Spirit of God, therefore what? The kingdom is among you. Kingdom is here. Why? Because there is warfare. We're at a battleship now. He's saying we are on this big battleship and we are fighting. This is our ammunition. When, when the Holy Spirit is upon you and you're able to cast out a demon by the Spirit of God, 
it means the kingdom is here now we're at war and then he in this later story in chapter 13 Jesus, Jesus was talking about the different kind of uh, soils you know the sea scattered and all the different places and then people say oh, what does it mean what does it mean and then Jesus explained to them the mysteries of the kingdom okay and he says ah the mystery is only for you guys it's not meant for everybody so what do we find here we find mystery and authority and there is a certain part about the mysteries of God that that we have in this kingdom and then we have to understand there is authority and you're gonna see the confirmation of that in the next next chapter in chapter 16 we find chapter 16 and 18 we we read earlier already but let me read it again what's the kingdom of God and I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overcome it. Do you see there's a warfare going on? Hades, there's a, there's a power of this earth that is trying to overcome your church, the church of Jesus Christ. And I said, uh, and Jesus said, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you lose on earth will be loose in heaven. Do you see the role of the church here? The role of the church is to engage warfare. The role of the church to engage spiritual warfare with the spirit of this earth. You must understand that. And a lot of people go to church. A lot of people go to church. They don't even understand. They don't understand the warfare that's going on. They don't know that there is a battle taking place. So they've been on a cruise ship all this time. And they once in a while they complain about the bad food that gives diarrhea. Okay? Once in a while they'll say, you know, that destination, I'm not coming with you guys. I've been there before. That's boring. You know? Some people have been on the Ensenada trip too many times. They say, ah, I've been there too many times. I'll stay on the boat and enjoy my food. I'm not going to go to Ensenada. Okay? You guys go. I've been there, done it. Some people have that kind of mentality. They have the cruise line mentality it's because it's all about them. And once their trip is done, where do they end up? coming back home fatter that's it they don't realize there's a battle taking place and here is a battle this is uh, on my way to the campground we have a new friend uh, Tim uh, we're just talking and I'm not gonna tell you who he was referring to but he was talking about testimony of believers testimony of believers you know some believers they have a, a testimony when they share with other people not too many people are excited about this testimony. Okay? Him and I were just talking about that. And, and I, you know, he has a question. He said, well, what do you about, do about that? I, I said, you know what? If indeed what the Bible teaches is real, you can experience this, this authority, this power, and this mystery every day. How can you not convince people? How can you not convince people this is real? How can you not have a good testimony? Are you with me? The problem is that we're, we've been eating on the cruise ship. Well, we're not engaging warfare. When everybody's out there battling, you're, <laughs> you're in the cabin. You're, you're in the bar and the lounge and you're in that treadmill trying to look good. What are we doing here? The church represents God on earth because it has the authority of God and it has to be able to exercise authority. And I can tell you the way we do church, a lot of us, we do... Christianity in a vacuum and this is what I explained to Tim I said you know what I can't talk about cooking with you to make you full are you with me we can talk about cooking all we want the only time when you're full in your stomach is when we actually cook something and then what you eat it come on we can talk about all kinds of, you know, you guys, we got Food Channel on TV nowadays, all kinds of different cooking shows, and everybody's, I like this one, I like that one, I like this one. And then by the time you're done with all this cooking, you're really, really hungry. But then this is what happened to the church. When you talk about so many spiritual things, everybody's really hungry, but nobody's taking a bite. That's what's going on. And that's why nobody's satisfied. Say, ah, oh, you'll be satisfied, but you're not taking a bite. No, we've been talking about spirituality in a vacuum, in a classroom, in a church sanctuary, when the reality is that battle must be taking place in the world. In the world. All right? So the church represents God. I love it when she's walking around. It just adds a flavor of the service. 
so so great um she feels so free here isn't that wonderful ah praise the lord little angels all right what is the kingdom of god and, and here i'm just going to go brush through really quickly 19 21 25 19 uh, 23 says then jesus said to his disciples truly i tell you it, it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven why do you think it is hard for a rich to enter the heaven boy I think it's not the money that has a problem. It's the heart, isn't it? When you, when you don't repent from the world, its values and the systems and the principles, you don't repent from the culture, you will be caught. You will be caught. And that's what happened here. And verse uh, 43 of 21 says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. And, and you know, this is when, when there was a, a, a parable of Jesus and, and there was people that did not want to come, that did not want to produce. And then what happens? Jesus took it away from them. Took it away from them. I'm going to give it to those people who's going to produce. <gasps> what? That's kind of mean. Jesus, you're mean. Yeah, I can tell you, Jesus is mean sometimes. He gives to you his love for free. But you know what? If you're not going to produce any fruit, take that away from you and give it to someone else. It's not the secret of the church. It's not. We just don't want to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about it. Mean Jesus? You ever thought about a mean Jesus? When was the last time Jesus took something away from you? I can tell you, anyone who doesn't want to do anything, Anything, anyone who doesn't want to put forth his life for the Lord, or whatever you got, all the gifting, all the talents can be taken away from you and give to somebody else who will produce. Why? Because the kingdom is not about receiving. The kingdom is not about receiving. Not, not like a cruise ship where you just constantly benefit. Oh, more food, more food, more food, more food. Guess what happened? You die from more food. You die from more food. Come on, guys. Do you agree? T turn to the person next to you and say, you will die. Well, that's not a curse, but, but it says that if you continue to consume without giving, the greatest moment in a person's life has to be the moment that they give, contribute. Somebody say amen. Th that's happened to Jesus. The greatest moment in Jesus' life was when he died on the cross for all humanity. Come on. Somebody say amen. That has to be the greatest moment because that's what Romans talk about right and then that last part of 25 verse 1 says at that time the kingdom of heaven will be like 10 virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom what happened to the other what happened to the other uh, the, these virgins did not make it in some made it in others did not make it in is that a good story or what you know, it's like a nighttime story, you know, we always like to talk about a good, good ending, isn't it? We just love a good story that ends the night. And uh, how many of you went, well, I watched the movie The Croods the other day, we had it showing here. And you've probably all seen it. I, I don't know if you've, the, the movie The Croods. Yeah, and I just love that the dad tells a story like this. Uh, this little bear that went out and uh, explored new things and then had a great time and then died! <laughs> it died. <laughs> That's not a good bedtime story, obviously. It's not, okay? But, but, <laughs> but Jesus reminds us that some people will not make it in. And they will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And that's exactly a quote from the Bible. They will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What does that mean? What does it mean when they're weeping and gnashing of teeth? You know, what is it? You watch Korean soap proper, you get it. <laughs> a lot of grief, a lot of, a lot of guilt, a lot of shame. It just, you don't know how to describe it. That's why we say weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because what, what can you do? Some people throw things. Well, what if there's nothing for you to throw? You know, what do you do? Some people make it in. That's what the Bible says. All right? So some will not enter. That's the kingdom. And kind of to summarize everything, we have citizen or repentance, go for the believers, the core of the, the gospel, authority and mystery, uh, church represent God, and some will not enter. What, is, what does it all mean? What I want to remind you in the last part of Matthew, because 
Matthew begins with the baby Jesus being born and the whole genealogy and some of you love genealogy I'm not into genealogy but I have to read the genealogy to understand what it means so Genesis chapter 1 talks about the genealogy of Jesus Christ and at the end of this whole thing is that it talks about the king and then finally talks about the king leaving in chapter 28 are you with me? the king leaving and this is a passage then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Why do we need to talk about authority? Because men and women have lost. We all have lost authority. We lost authority. Bless you, bless you. Authority. Not blessing you, but authority. Okay? We lost authority. Lost authority in our own life. Authority in nature, authority in, in all of God's ways. So verse 19 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This is the end of the story for Matthew. What a wonderful ending. But I want to highlight, and I threw, throw, I threw in a, a few Greek words over there, okay? And I'm going to test James to read it for us. Okay. Okay, that's pretty pretty good. Pretty good. Huh? Paru thentes un mathe tu sate panta ta ethne. Okay, that's Greek. I showed off for today. I showed off enough for the day. Yes, thank you. Let's go home now. No, no, no. The point I want to bring out is, is that this, what is this saying to us? The first word means to go. Just he's saying to go. It, it's an imperative to go. Uh, and then the next two words to to make for me, to to make for me disciples. Okay? Because there's actually there's no word for make in there. Is to uh, disciple me. Okay? Disciple for me. So, so go make disciple for me. Not, don't say word. Uh, just disciple me. Uh, for me. All right? And then panta means all. And then you guys recognize the last word. Ethne. Ethne. What does ethne re re uh, sounds like in English? Ethnic or ethnicity. The original word is ethnos. Ethnos. So, so go disciple for me all ethnicity does that make sense all ethnicities it means all peoples all peoples and uh, that's the calling from the Lord why do we emphasize ethnic here because God wants all ethnicity all people groups to come to the saving knowledge of his son to be entering into the kingdom of God amen do you see that okay so is that is that why we do multi-ethnic ministry here come on we're being obedient here okay <laughs> all right so so therefore you must go and make disciple for me from all ethnic groups and that could be one translation that's uh, mine all right big question now big question because at beginner which one's bigger the church or the kingdom kingdom is bigger the church is a portion, is a, is a small part of that kingdom. And the church has the responsibility to demonstrate the kingdom and the power presence of God. All right? So the kingdom of God, what is God's domain? And I want, to, want you to look at some pictures. Is this in print in your head? And that's what's good about PowerPoint is that you get download pictures and people say, wow, that's great. All right? Country. Domain of God. Ethnicity, domain of God. Languages, domain of God. Gender and age, domain of God. Profession, what do you do? Domain of God. Ethnic status, domain of God. And, uh, me? Oh, okay. <laughs> Economic status. I'm not, I'm not reading it right. This is where my uh, dyslexia comes in. Economic status comes in. This is domain of God. You see, this is I, I love this pictures because on one side you got this really expensive condominium, and next to it, all shanties. And and, and uh, you guys probably see this a lot in the Philippines, right? Very expensive, nice buildings on one side, and then 
right outside you have squatters right that's part of God's domain part of God's domain so what is the kingdom of God because a lot of times we, if, we, if the confine of the kingdom of God is inside the church then we're missing out on the real big picture the bigger picture is this that there are governments their marketplace their family education and media do you think the church can contribute to any one of these in fact the church should be able to contribute to all of them the church should be able to contribute to the government don't just complain about the government being you know more and more and more secular American government eh, you know we, we complain about the government a lot but I can tell you what's wrong with that is that because you don't have enough good Christians in there we're, we're not we're not setting sending enough good Christians in the government and the marketplace oh the marketplace is so corrupt and you know the, the priorities are wrong well don't complain about the marketplace you need to send more good Christians into the marketplace somebody say amen all right how many of you work in the marketplace come on you all do you all do we, we need to go to the marketplace and transform their ways okay family how many of you have family okay <laughs> we all have part of families right what do you think the church has to do with the family everything everything how about education don't just complain about the rain rainbow curriculum send more educators out there send more teachers out there media oh. most people think of that as uh, Las Vegas right the, the, the corrupt place but I tell you we need to send more believers into the media transform media for the Lord don't let it corrupt our job is to preserve preserve for God's goodness you know the gospel is not the church I think we're too selfish if we we think of all God's plan has to do with just us we are part of his plan but you must realize God has a bigger peace in mind he's thinking about the kingdom all the different realms and why are we here as a church we're gonna take over the world we're here start with our city we're here to transform the city now even though we're small I, I, I believe we have a core people here core people here developing a a church that has to do with generations generational church because once you lose the generations you lose the gospel how do we bring the generations together isn't it beautiful beautiful to see all the different ages here little ones walking around it's a beautiful thing that's part of God's plan second thing very important how do we bridge the gospel bring the kingdom from the church into the world bridging communities that is very important that is very important so why are we here we're here to shine in the city of Cerritos we're here to um, set the captives free in the name of Jesus God brought a lot of good people we have a lot of good leaders among us and that's what we're here for to fight to fight this good fight yes we can be a cruise ship have some good time but we're also a battleship we're here to wage war against the principalities forces of darkness that's plaguing our world today so let us pray